Uh, first, uh, let me uh, thank you for coming to this uh, press conference. Uh, first, uh, let me uh, share a few uh, updates. We are now about a week into the phase one of uh, safe opening. With the increased interaction among people, we expect that there will be a rise in the number of COVID-19 cases in the coming days and weeks. This is uh, inevitable. We have seen this happening in many other countries as they open their economy and their community. What is important for us is to mitigate the risk with basic hygiene practices and precautions and ring, fen ring, ring fencing cases quickly with timely contact tracing so that large clusters do not form. Testing is a key enabler of our overall efforts to safely reopen. We carry out testing for various purposes, which I mentioned uh, some time ago. Let me just reiterate some of them. Uh, for example, firstly, we do testing to identify cases quickly so that we can provide timely and appropriate treatment and support for persons who are infected with uh, COVID-19 uh, to prevent complication and uh, to reduce the risk of mortality. We also do that to identify close contacts so that we can ring fence close contacts quickly to prevent uh, the spread of the disease. We also do screening for specific target groups, for example, those who are more vulnerable, such as those in the uh, uh, elderly in the nursing homes and so on, uh, to prevent a cluster from forming and to uh, basically conduct surveillance. At the same time, we also have specific groups like uh, workers going back to work. We want to screen them to make sure that they are safe in returning to work. So we carry out testing in a variety of uh, uh, reasons, but all with the specific targets and specific objectives. Many Singaporeans have also noticed that while the number of new cases in the community remain low, it has increased somewhat in the past week. Some worry that the cases in the community have risen quickly after the reopening. In fact, many of the community cases we have seen in the past week were due to active case finding as we proactively conduct surveillance to test on our target groups. This is important as it will allow us to identify COVID-19 cases early and to quickly contain any potential spread in the community. So far, we have conducted active surveillance uh, amongst a few target groups. For example, we have done so for staff and residents in the residential homes for seniors, as I mentioned, because seniors living in residential institutions are more vulnerable. Preschool staff as well as a precautionary measure before preschools resume their full services. We have also carried out screening for those returning to work, especially in the construction, marine and process sectors in preparation for the reopening of more workplaces. We have also extended testing to individuals who are diagnosed with acute respiratory uh, infection, ARIs, at first uh, presentation to a doctor instead of uh, observing them for a few days. We are starting first with groups such as uh, seniors, 65 years and above, healthcare workers, as well as staff of educational institutions and older students. That was how we picked up the six cases yesterday from school students and staff. The test for these cases revealed low viral loads and a repeat test using new samples found that all six cases were negative. This suggests that they were likely infected during the circuit breaker period and not after school reopening. To support the increase in screening, the Health Promotion Board, HPB, has been setting up regional screening centres progressively across the island. Two of these centres at the Old Police Academy and the float at Marina Bay have commenced operations from 2nd of June. We have set up two more centres today at Bukit Gombak and Bishan Sports Halls with another centre on the way in Badok North. Workers in the dormitory will continue to be swapped at designated centres set up within the dormitories or other areas conveniently located for them, such as migrant worker recreation centres. There are also other swapping centres being set up in collaboration with our private sector partners such as a testing facility at One Ferrer Hotel. I thank these partners for being part of our fight against COVID-19. We will continue to set up more swabbing centres with a different capacity to meet our national needs. Even as we ramp up 
testing and contact tracing, strong infection control measures will continue to be the mainstay of our fight against COVID-19. We must therefore continue to practice strict safe distancing and good personal hygiene to prevent transmission. Let us press on with our efforts, stay united, and I believe we will be able to overcome this pandemic. Now I'll call upon my uh, Director of Medical Services, Professor Kenneth Mark, to give a quick update on today's medical situation. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. As of the 8th of June uh, at 12 p.m. today, the Ministry of Health had preliminarily confirmed an additional 386 cases of COVID-19 infection in Singapore. The vast majority are uh, work permit holders residing in foreign worker dormitories, and based on our investigation so far, uh, there are two cases in the community, of which one is a Singaporean and the other is a work pass holder. But we're still working through those details, and further updates will be shared uh, via the press release that the Ministry of Health will issue later tonight. Thank you. Um, good evening. Let me just uh, say a few words uh, to add to what Minister Gan had shared just now. A week has passed since we exited the circuit breaker. The, there has indeed been some increase in the number of daily cases in the community, but as you can see, it's partly due to our stepped-up testing regime. On the whole, uh, our assessment is that the situation over the past week remains under control and the new daily cases are within expectations. Uh, so we, are continue to, we will continue to monitor the situation over the coming week. And as we have explained before, by the middle of the month, we will decide on whether or not to make the next move to phase two. Uh, meanwhile, we should continue to take all the necessary precautions and safeguards uh, in order to keep community transmission low. Uh, we appeal to everyone in Singapore that our mindset should not be to exploit each and every rule to the fullest possible degree, but really to understand the spirit of the regulations and to continue to uphold the precautions, stay home wherever possible, minimize contacts uh, to the largest extent possible. Uh, some people ask, you know, but I'm going to work and I already see many people on public transport. So if that's the case, why can't you, we open up the, uh, relax the measures for me to see more of my family and friends? I understand why these comparisons are made, but I think we need to um, better understand that the settings and risk are very different. In public transport, the fact that we are allowing people to return to work, to go back to schools, means that inevitably there will be more people using tra public transport. And when that happens, it will be hard to maintain that physical distance between one another. We've highlighted this when we went into the phase one of the reopening. We knew that this was going to be difficult and we explained that it was potentially not possible to maintain a physical distance. And that's why we take other precautions, including wearing of masks, uh, including requiring people not to talk when they are on public transport, and step up the cleaning of the trains and the buses. So with all of these measures, we can minimise the risk uh, on public transport. In any case, the public transport journeys are not long. These are transient risks, but with these additional precautions, we are able to minimise the risk further and ensure that uh, public transport journeys are safe. Uh, but social interactions are of a different magnitude of risk altogether. When we gather together, whether to talk, to um, interact, to have a meal together, I, the risks are much higher. And the evidence we have for cases in Singapore and also the evidence around the world shows that a large, the vast majority of cases, of infected cases, are typically spread by these few events that involve social interactions and gatherings. And that's why we have been much stricter on limiting such social gatherings in phase one. 
So when you look at what we have in phase one overall, I think we need to look at the overall suite of measures we've put in place. Uh, we want people to return to work, children to go back to schools. We have safe management practices and measures in these settings. But overall, we remain quite tight, particularly in terms of limiting social interactions and gatherings. And if we all do our part to comply with the measures in phase one, we will be able to keep community transmission low and stable throughout this period. And it gives us a much better chance of getting into phase two early. There are two critical enablers for us to continue to control the infection through phase one and even beyond phase one. And we've highlighted these before testing, which we are continuing to ramp up. And now we're putting in place these screening centers in the community. And second, contact tracing. We've also beefed up our manpower and contact tracing teams, and we are using technology to help us do faster and more effective contact tracing. And that's why we've also invited Minister Vivian here to share more about what we are doing on this front. Um, so I hope everyone understands where we are today um, and where we are heading. We have highlighted the roadmap before. Uh, so far, we are still proceeding on track to that roadmap, and we look forward to everyone's cooperation to help us keep uh, transmission under control. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now invite uh, Dr. Uh, Vivian Balakrishnan. He's overseeing our development in the technology side, and he will share with us how technology, we are using technology to strengthen our capability in contact tracing. Thanks, Kim Yong. Good evening, everyone. I'm here a guest appearance uh, today uh, to deal with some of the issues and the questions that have arisen with respect to the digital tools that we're using for contact tracing. I basically just want to make three points. The first point is that good contact tracing is absolutely essential if we are to break this chain of transmission that characterizes this COVID-19. It enables us to quickly identify the patient, to provide treatment for the patient quickly, and to isolate them so that the patient does not infect other people. For everyone else who's not yet a patient, it is in our own interest to know quickly and early whether any of us have had close exposure to a patient who is COVID-19 positive. Why is this important? Knowing that we've been exposed enables us to take appropriate precautions for ourselves, and equally important, to take precautions so that we, in turn, do not inadvertently convey that virus to our own family members, our close colleagues, and our loved ones. And because over the last few months, we have also discovered that peak viral load occurs early in the evolution of the disease. And in fact, there are cases, pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic cases of transmission, that makes it all the more vital that we identify both patients and close contacts as soon as possible. I can't emphasize enough the need for quick identification. And this is where the digital tools come in. It used to take us about two to three days of intensive laborious work to reconstruct an activity map for each patient. And you need to bear in mind that sometimes by the time the patient is in and our contact tracer is trying to interview the patient, sometimes the patient is not even in a fit state to be able to provide all the necessary information. But today, with the digital tools which we have made available, I'm glad to be able to report that it now takes us less than a day from the identification of a patient to issuing the necessary quarantine orders to that person's contacts. This reduction from two or three days to less than a day makes a crucial difference. And it is even more important now that we are opening up. We're no longer in a circuit breaker. 
people are going to work, people are taking public transport, people are interacting more. This ability to move and identify quickly has become even more crucial. Now, one very useful tool so far has been traced together. And as of today, we have almost 1.8 million people who have downloaded and uh, acti activated this app. 1.8 million in our context means about one quarter of our population. And this, I must stress, has been on a voluntary basis. Now, we all know that in the case of the efficacy for these apps, the higher the proportion of people who have downloaded and are actively using it, the more efficacious it becomes, and that increase is exponential. So what I'm saying is that 25% is good, but it is not good enough, and we need to raise that number significantly. One barrier that we have had to increasing that number is the fact that not everyone has a smartphone, or a smartphone that works effectively enough to supply all the data that we need. So that's why we took a decision to expand the Trace Together program to include a device, a device which we are going to call Trace Together Token. The device will operate and function exactly the same way Trace Together on a smartphone does. So here's where I need to emphasize and repeatedly emphasize it is not a tracking device. It is not an electronic tag, as some internet commentaries have fretted about. In particular, and here to be technical, there is no GPS chip on the device. There isn't even any internet or mobile telephony connectivity. And what this means, if, there, if there's no GPS chip, the device cannot track the location or movement of any of us. Secondly, because there is no internet connectivity, there is no possibility of data being uploaded without the participation and consent of the user. So this is a crucial dimension that needs to be emphasized and re-emphasized. And the next thing which I need to emphasize again to come back to Trace Together and how it works is that the data that Trace Together, both on the phone as well as on the device, captures is only Bluetooth proximity data. And that data never leaves the device or the phone. It is encrypted. It is stored for up to 25 days and automatically deleted. The only time the data leaves the phone or the device is in the unlikely event that you are diagnosed with COVID-19. Then, and only then, is the data uploaded to MOH. And in the case of the device, you actually need a physical possession of the device in order to hand over the data to MOH. And only a very limited restricted team of contact tracers will have access to that data in order to help reconstruct the activity map to jog your memory and to work out the full range of interactions which a patient may have had. So it's worth emphasizing that there isn't one big giant centralized database. In fact, the data is decentralized and encrypted on phones and on devices and only upload it if it is positive. So again, I want to emphasize there is no electronic tagging. There is no geolocation tracking. This is only purely focused on Bluetooth proximity data and only used for contact tracing. One other point which has arisen is about data protection. Well, as I said earlier on, the first point is that there isn't one big, giant, central database. Second, even the finite silos of data that are uploaded are protected by the public sector data security recommendations. The review committee will continue to oversee this and oversee this very tightly. 
All the officers involved are covered by the Official Secrets Act. And we will continue to audit and make sure that no data leakage occurs. We will continue to test the devices, test our systems, and remember, ultimately, the real test of the pudding is whether we can shorten the time from identification of a patient or close contact to isolation, bring down the effective reproduction number of this epidemic, and also reassure people that we are getting the balance right between protecting public health and protecting personal privacy. I believe it is possible to protect both, and we're going to do so in a manner which is open and transparent, and I'll be happy to take questions on that note. Thank you. Uh, questions from the floor? Thank you, panelists. We will now begin with the Q&A. Members of media, please remember to use the raise hand function if you would like to ask a question. Please only ask one question to allow more to participate. Please know that contents from the press conference are embargoed until after the end of press conference. We will announce when the embargo is lifted. May we have the first question from Timothy from Straight Times, please? Hey, thank you, Ministers, GMS. Uh, now, I'd like to ask about testing. You mentioned that the testing criteria has been extended to those with ARIs. Can anyone refuse to be tested, for example, at the GPs? And are the testing centers for PCR or serology tests and for first time or repeat and regular testing? Thank you. Uh, Timothy, that was quite a mouthful. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, you, would you like to perhaps uh, repeat that, but slowly? And I, I just want to make sure I caught every bit of your question so that we can do justice to it and answer it. My, my apologies. Um, well, you mentioned that the testing criteria has been extended to those with ARIs. Can anybody refuse to be tested? For example, if you go to the GP with an ARI and you're told you need to take a test. And are the testing centers for PCR or serology tests and for first time or repeat testing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Timothy. I got that now. Uh, yes, we expanded the uh, criteria, uh, the suspect case criteria, which uh, we use to uh, inform and guide our family physicians, our doctors, uh, in deciding when to test. And certainly, if a person comes to see a GP and fulfills these criteria, the GP will encourage that patient uh, to undergo testing. And if the individual uh, refuses, uh, the, the GP would uh, continue to counsel, to strongly encourage. But at the end of the day, um, the GP will not be, uh, be able to force that particular person to uh, undergo testing uh, at this point in time. We have uh, indicated and advised uh, doctors that if they are very concerned about a particular individual when they are many suspicious features. They've had close contact with a person known to have COVID-19. Um, they themselves are very symptomatic. Uh, then it's really in the interest of the patient um, uh, to make sure that the patient is well for his safety and welfare, that uh, the GP then inform us, and we will then take on the, um, the responsibility of continuing to reach out to that particular patient to encourage that patient to step forward and uh, do testing. Under the Infectious Diseases Act, we can uh, uh, mandate testing, but we would like to do this first by encouraging the patient to step forward because it's important uh, for a person to uh, be willing to do so, and we believe uh, that's the, uh, a better approach. Uh, we will encourage uh, patients to step forward and do testing first. The testing regime involves a PCR testing still at this time because PCR testing would be the relevant test for the purposes of making a diagnosis of an acute infection, and this is uh, the test approach. Just to uh, uh, clarify, currently we already test uh, uh, ARI cases, but we generally yeah. test the prolonged <laughs> ARI, ARI cases because we, uh, when, when you present yourself to the GPs, the GPs have been asked to give you uh, five days, uh, up to five days MC from the day of uh, illness. And then if there's a prolonged uh, illness, you come back, then we will suggest a, a test. So this is not uh, entirely new. What we have done is and we have now shortened the period once you present yourself to the GP, if you have ARI symptoms, we will swap you uh, straight away rather than to have to send you back and wait for the period. Because uh, the time when we wait for the uh, uh, protracted period, 
uh, there may be infection that's going on. So we want to establish as early as possible in order for us to start contact tracing earlier. So that's one of the objectives of uh, bringing forward the testing of ARI cases. And this is also important to underline that the, uh, uh, one of the objectives of this uh, ARI testing is to also to protect your family members and your friends whom you have been in contact with. So it is not just for purposes of public health, for our MOH purposes, but also for a proper treatment of the patient and to allow us to do contact tracing to protect your family members and your friends as soon as possible if you are confirmed a positive case. So we urge uh, uh, patients to cooperate with us. So far, we have not had to uh, enforce uh, uh, our uh, infectious diseases uh, uh, legislation. Uh, we have the powers to do so, but we pre prefer not to use it because we need to continue to have the support and cooperation of the patients because we also need him to help us recall who his contacts are so that we are able to proceed with the contact tracing. So I think uh, this uh, doctor and patient rela relationship is very important for us to preserve as much as possible. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, DMS. May we have the next question from CNA? Jolela, please. Thank you. Um, just want to ask about testing. Uh, we noted that um, earlier the calibration uh, issues identified uh, with one lab led to false positives. So I just want to check whether those have been resolved. And um, would MOH also be able to explain why there are days when fewer tests have been conducted? Um, are we at full capacity in terms of testing right now? Uh, yes, thank you very much for that question. I think you had two parts to it. The first part, you were asking about uh, labs and whether or not, uh, in fact, previous lab processes have been optimized, whether or not those uh, previous problems we had with the lab uh, have been resolved. My understanding is that it has, uh, and that lab, in fact, continues to contribute towards testing uh, of our uh, cases as well. However, we have a quality improvement program that uh, continues to engage all our laboratories and uh, there's a regular uh, dialogue and discussion that takes place with all the laboratories to help them to ensure that the processes continue to be up to speed and that they are maintaining the quality of testing that they're supposed to have. So in fact, uh, that continues on a weekly basis uh, regularly. Uh, you asked also about uh, uh, another question. Can I just perhaps uh, just get you to remind me what the second part was? Oh, yes. I, In terms of the numbers um, of tests, uh, well, um, we actually uh, test across different settings. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when we uh, carry out testing uh, of various uh, groups, we do have uh, a certain allocation in mind, but uh, sometimes that number may vary from day to day, depending on, for example, the group of people that, uh, uh, how they are scheduled to come forward for testing. Uh, in the dormitory setting, testing also continues with a view towards helping us to clear blocks, uh, clear front workers who have recovered from infection or to ensure that they are not infected so as to eventually uh, uh, be able to bring them back into uh, the work setting. And depending on which dormitory uh, uh, is uh, allocated for that particular day, you may end up with more numbers in a particular day, fewer numbers in other days. So the number does vary uh, uh, sometimes from a larger number in one day and a smaller number in another day. We have not uh, changed our testing tempo. Uh, so in that sense, the number of tests allocated continue to be uh, uh, there and made available for all these uh, different test settings. We have, uh, uh, in addition to uh, testing the usual way, started to expand also into other strategies. That includes uh, the use of pooled test approaches uh, rather than individual PCR tests uh, being done so as to maximize the efficiency that we have uh, for testing. And that contributes to an increased uh, mileage, so to speak, uh, extends the reach that we have with the test uh, kits that we, uh, that we have available. Thank you, DMS. Um, can we have the next question from Taobao? Sun Kiet, please. Hi, good evening, ministers and DMS. Sun Kiet from Taobao. My questions are for Dr. Balakrishnan uh, with regard to the devices. First, when's the earliest that we can expect the devices to be rolled out? Uh, second, how would they be distributed to the masses? And thirdly, would the use of such devices be mandated by law, given that you know um, the take-up rate of the Trace Together app is low since it's optional? Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, first question is on when. Um, the first batch will probably be delivered in the latter half of this month. Uh, so we will roll that out progressively at that point. And as I said, we are focusing on digital inclusion, which means those who currently don't have a smartphone or don't have a smartphone that works well enough to provide the necessary data to MOH. The second question is on how it will be distributed. Well, I will say that we've now got quite extensive experience with distribution to the population. Uh, so I'm sure we'll rely on similar uh, means, basically through the community centres and, and so on, depending on where it is needed and depending on our priorities at that point in time. Your third question, which is on whether it should be mandated. Well, let me start from first principles. Today we have 25% uh, on a voluntary basis. Do I believe that we can increase it further on a voluntary basis? I believe we can. We need to educate, we need to reassure, we need to demonstrate to people the value that comes from downloading and using it for yourself. That you are helping to protect the community, you're protecting your own family, and even for yourself, because as I said earlier, if you have the app or the device, if you have been exposed to someone who's positive. You may not know that, the person may not know that, but the system will be able to inform you of that. So I still believe that if Singaporeans are, if we explain it and explain it well and persuade Singaporeans, we can still increase its usage significantly. Secondly, the fact that we now have devices which will also make it more inclusive is another opportunity to increase it further. My third point may sound a bit more philosophical, but with the permission of the two co-chairs, when you're controlling a pandemic like this, actually there are many aspects of it you cannot legislate. You can have rules, you can pass laws, you can enforce it. The majority of people will comply with both the spirit and the letter of the law. And unfortunately, a minority sometimes will try to find loopholes. Actually, the same principle applies even for contact tracing or even for testing and the doctor-patient relationship. If we can get a spirit of trust, openness, compassion, mutual responsibility, and we can get our population to understand that and subscribe to it and act on that impulse, our ability to overcome this pandemic will be so much greater. So what I'm saying is I'm going to do my best to try to push the participation rates up without having to go down the mandatory route. Whether or not circumstances will ever worsen to the point where MOH may say we have no choice, that is something which we cannot predict at this point in time. So I hope you understand the, what, what is more important to understand is the spirit behind what we are rolling out and why we are doing what we are doing. And if there's feedback, if there's concerns, if there is genuinely health anxiety, it is our duty to address it, to respond to that, and if need be, to make changes to the execution plan. Thank you, Minister. We will now have the next question from Financial Times. Stefania, please. Hi, hello, panel. Um, I was wondering if you could give us any update on uh, the discussions to set up green uh, lanes for travel uh, between Singapore and other countries. Obviously, uh, there were uh, announcements with regards to uh, the agreement with uh, China's six provinces, but could you give us uh, any other updates on uh, um, other agreements you might be uh, close to um, finalizing or are ready to, to be launched? The discussions are underway with 
explained the, or we have shared some of the countries that we are having discussions with. So as and when we are ready to announce the, uh, when these green lanes have been established, uh, we will certainly share um, the good news with everyone. Our, our basic principle is that we, we are looking to establish more green lanes with selected countries where the infection is under control. We have explained or we have shared before which are the countries that we are having discussions with. Um, and we have also talked about what the protocols will be like, where testing is done. And so with the test done, the travelers will be able to um, travel essentially for work reasons. So we are limiting to these uh, work travel and the numbers will be controlled. So that's the basic principle. And we expect as we continue with these discussions and if the conditions permit, one country bilaterally, but more countries eventually over time. And perhaps at some stage, the green lanes may expand to travel bubbles for the whole region. Thank you, Minister. We will now have the next question from today. Justin, please. Yes, thanks, Ministers, for the briefing. Um, it was said by Minister Wong earlier that based on previous weeks, for every symptomatic case in Singapore, there will be one that, is, uh, that shows no symptoms. So what are the implications of the fact that half of the cases in Singapore have no symptoms? And does it suggest the need to do nationwide testing since there could be a substantial number of uh, hidden cases? We, so this is what we have found, you know, based on our recent observations that for every uh, symptomatic case, we see at least one case that's asymptomatic. And it's partly the result of our stepped-up testing. Uh, we've been doing more tests in the community. We've been doing more tests for nursing home staff and residents, for preschool teachers. And we are continuing to do this stepped-up testing across the board. I think the question of should we test everyone in the population? Well, ideally, we would like to test everyone, but we... When we talk about mass testing, we are still approaching this with a view towards understanding the risk and applying the tests where we think the risks are greatest. So we are doing testing for suspect cases. We are expanding the list of, of contacts. We are testing all of them. We are testing now those with respiratory symptoms. And that's a lot to go, you know, because if you talk about respiratory symptoms, um, pre-circuit breaker, you know, any single day, you had about 25,000 people presenting themselves with respiratory symptoms in a single day. During the circuit breaker, that number dropped to less than 5,000. It shows the success of the circuit breaker in stopping not only COVID-19, but all infectious diseases. So it reduced drastically. But as we resume activities, I think that number will rise, and we are going to test all of these patients with respiratory symptoms. So that's a lot already. And then we are going to go and look at different um, high-risk groups, including workers who are in the front line of COVID operations, construction, marine and process. We are going to test them regularly. We are also going to test regularly vulnerable groups, including the nursing home residents. So when you look at these priorities and risk, um, you know, we, there is a lot to go around. So we have to focus on these groups, apply the tests, and again, if our test capacity increases, certainly we will bring in more people to be tested. So that's our strategy. We are going for mass testing, we are going for large-scale testing, but we are still applying the test in a strategic and deliberate manner based on risk and based on where we see uh, you know, the test would yield uh, best results. I should uh, add that uh, I think this question has been asked almost every <laughs> press conference. Uh, I should uh, uh, add that uh, um, uh, you have to always bear in mind there's an incubation period. So even if you test all the whole population today, it doesn't mean that uh, they are not infected. In fact, some of them would have been infected, but not uh, the viral load may not have uh, risen to a level that is detectable. So if you do a population-wide testing, the 
risk is that those who are tested negative today will feel that they are safe and they go about doing everything and forget about uh, safe distancing and in, in the course of that, infect others when they become infectious. So it is important for us to deploy our testing uh, strategy in a very targeted way, focusing at the uh, risk managed approach, focusing on those that are high, has higher risk or has a higher probability of being infected so that we are able to detect uh, cases uh, as we go along. And uh, the, the, to the extent uh, possible, we test as much as we can in this um, uh, uh, very targeted and strategic way. Uh, but you will not be able to pick up every case in the community uh, as experienced in many other countries. In fact, in some countries, the uh, 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 detection rate is significantly lower than what we are seeing here to, today. So we do what we can to detect as much as we can. And therefore, contact tracing is very crucial because contact tracing will allow you to test in a very targeted way, even when they are asymptomatic. Some may be pre-symptomatic, some may be truly asymptomatic, they would have been infected and never have symptoms throughout the whole course of the infection. But through contact tracing, we will then be able to monitor them and test them in a, a proper way so that we are able to pick up cases even though they are asymptomatic. As we have seen, uh, we have uh, done quite a few screening exercises and through these exercises, we were able to pick up cases that will have been infected, not currently, but maybe some time ago, and they have not had any symptoms uh, throughout their course of an infection. By now, they would have recovered, and, but we still are able to detect them, partly from uh, serology testing and partly from contact tracing to allow us to do that. And therefore, contact tracing plays a very important part in allowing us to detect those that are asymptomatic. Just to reinforce and to extend uh, what uh, Ministers uh, Wong and Gan had uh, actually mentioned, the most important strategy when it comes to dealing with asymptomatic cases in our population is not community testing on a wide scale. The most important strategy remains the discipline for safe distancing mask wearing, which aims therefore to protect each and every one of us uh, from people who are asymptomatic. And if you are asymptomatic and infected, it serves to protect those around you uh, and minimize the risk that you are spreading infection to other people. So that in fact is the most important set of measures that we can take to prevent spread from asymptomatic cases uh, and less uh, the issue in, uh, with regard to committee testing. Thank you, Ministers and JMS. We'll have the next question from Channel 8 News. Kari, please. Hello. Hi. Uh, I understand that today Malaysia announced that the discussions are underway with the Singapore government to allow Malaysians to travel to Singapore for work. So we'd like to ask, so uh, what are the details you all are discussing? Are you all looking at um, any specific industry workers that can come into Singapore first? When likely the announcement will be made? Thank you. So this is, again, part of the ongoing discussions that we have with different countries, including Malaysia, our na closest neighbour, because of the large volume of uh, human flows, uh, not just by air, but also through the land crossings. And the same principle will apply, right? That we will, we welcome these human uh, travellers. We want to see a resumption of travel, but it has to be done in a safe way. And that would mean looking at testing protocols in place on both sides before the travellers can come back and forth. And also um, looking at that if not all of them can be done through testing, then some groups may have to be done through a quarantine period, a combination of both. But uh, it's regardless whether it's testing or SHN or quarantine requirement, measures and safeguards and precautions have to be put in place to ensure the resumption of safe travel between Singapore and Malaysia. So we are discussing all these with um, our Malaysian counterparts, exactly how many people, what kinds of protocols will be put in place, and then which industries. Uh, the, I think we are quite clear, it's not going to be going back to where we were before the circuit breaker or before COVID-19 hit us. We're not talking about large volumes, da da daily commuters coming in and out freely. That situation, um, we are not going back to that situation. Right? So we're talking about resumption of travel, but in a controlled manner and in a safe manner for both sides. 
and that's in our mutual interest. Thank you, Minister. We'll have the next question from Power98. Andrea, please. Hi, Ministers. Um, I just have a question for uh, Dr. Balakrishnan. So, will safe distancing or any kind of offences that are uh, detected from the, from the device combined with other programmes like safe entry and all that, will they be prosecutable? What do you mean by the offences from the device? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. So the device doesn't have any like tracking and all that, as Dr. Balakrishnan mentioned. But um, if combined with other things like safe entry and all that, where there is data that tracks where you are, where you check in and all that, um, if there are offences such as um, you know not wearing a mask and all that, will they be you know will will they be uh, prosecutable then? No, I, I think let's take this separately. Um, the wearing of mask, if it's a completely different matter, right? And it's I, I can't imagine how a Bluetooth device can detect somebody not wearing a mask to begin with. But it's not. There is no intention to use a trace together app or a trace together token to as a means of picking up breaches of existing rules. There is no intention at all, right? So the app and the device plus safe entry combined are meant to provide us with information in a timely manner so that we can do speedy and fast and effective contact tracing. It's not meant as a way to detect offences and breaches of rules. Yeah, I think that's a very important clarification. Trace together app, trace together running on the device, and the data generated is purely for contact tracing, period. Thank you, ministers. We'll have the next question from Kyodo News. City, please. City, we'll come back to you. We will now take um, the next question from Tamil Murasu. Venga, please. Hi. Uh, so the task force has been quite clear that with when we're uh, seeing the resumption of activities in Singapore, that the community cases will rise and we can expect to rise. And we have uh, recently seen places like Mustafa, Tampani Mall, and uh, places where people visit, um, you know, uh, where... COVID patients are visiting, or uh, people with COVID are visiting these places. Uh, so do you think that, you know, people in general should fear going to these places where uh, there have been cases of COVID-19, uh, you know, patients going to such places? So uh, generally, do you think, you know, people should fear and, or, or if, if not, you know, why so? Uh, ask the DMS to elaborate, but generally, uh, by the time we uh, identify the patient, uh, confirm a patient that is uh, infected with COVID-19, and we do contact tracing and identify the places he has been to, he is no longer at that place. And therefore, it is unlikely that uh, if you avoid uh, or if you visit that place, you are going to be infected by this patient because he is no longer at that place. He's probably in our care facilities, either in the hospital or in the CCF. Uh, therefore, there is actually no risk. And once we identify the patient, and when there is a risk in the venue, like his homes and uh, his workplace and so on, we will do a th thorough deep cleaning at the affected places to render it safe so that the workers and the family members can go back and continue where they are. So for places like Mustafa or shopping centre that he has been to, uh, there's uh, generally no risk. The risk doesn't exist because of this patient because he's no longer there and this probably quite a few days before uh, that he has been there. The purpose of us putting it up uh, in, uh, in our notices is not for people to avoid these places, but more for people who have been to these places during the time when the patients were there uh, so that we can uh, identify who you are because the contact tracing, as I said, may not be exhaustive today because we haven't got the uh, devices ready. 
So therefore, this will help us to uh, encourage people who have been there during that period of time to come forward if you are unwell so that we can uh, administer the appropriate test to determine whether you have been infected. This is part and parcel of extended uh, contact tracing beyond uh, the recall memory of the uh, patients. So say, for example, you may be in the restaurant and a particular time when actually someone is actually just seated next to you, he may remember that he's been there. And then if he's not well, he can come forward and we can do a proper test to determine whether he's infected. But it is not meant to uh, discourage people from going because the fact is that the patient is no longer there by the time we do the contact tracing and we announce the places. Let, yeah. let me make a plug. It's in precisely those circumstances when you can't remember when you were there that if you had the Trace Together app on, running on your phone or a device, and if you were in close proximity, prolonged close proximity as detected by Bluetooth, that's when the program would inform you, would alert you, and you can take the necessary precautions. Uh, announcing uh, or putting out a list of uh, places where uh, our previous cases had uh, visited is not new. In fact, when we started out managing the COVID outbreak in January, February, even into March, you may remember in our press releases, we had also uh, uh, given information. Uh, this case was diagnosed at this time, had visited this place. Uh, it wasn't intended to uh, broadcast where uh, these cases had gone to uh, ordinarily on its own. It was in fact, in fact uh, uh, to alert uh, members of the public so that if you happen to be in the vicinity of that area as well, you could now monitor your own health such that if you now develop symptoms uh, moving forward, bearing in mind that you may have been in a place where other cases have been before, it would now uh, help you to, uh, to know that you should step forward, see a doctor and get checked to make sure that you yourself are not having uh, any uh, symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 infection. Uh, so that still continues as well. So beyond uh, just uh, the importance of contact tracing, it's also to keep uh, uh, give you a, a reminder, uh, uh, ha give you a heads up so that you can also uh, uh, monitor yourself more closely if you uh, had visited those places. But there's nothing otherwise to fear uh, moving forward uh, visiting those places. Uh, as uh, Minister Gunn has mentioned, uh, uh, the cleaning would have been done. Um, uh, uh, it's not necessarily a case where just because a person had visited two, three days ago, uh, there's an ongoing risk of infection uh, occurring in a particular place. So the public should not fear uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, have that concern. That said, it's important to remember that we are just getting into phase one, uh, and, uh, and we haven't even gotten into phase two. We remain concerned about the possibility of community spread of, uh, of uh, COVID-19, and just as we let more people come out of homes, going to work, uh, going about their business, it's still important to remember that we should limit uh, travel outside our home and continue doing that only for necessary purposes. So don't travel about unnecessarily. Uh, the list of uh, places that previous cases has, uh, has visited should also be a reminder to us to remain disciplined to keep our travel uh, to the minimum. Thank you, ministers and DMS. Okay, we will now take the next, uh, we have time for last two questions. We will now take the next question from Kyodo. City, please. Yeah, hi, I'm sorry, I just unmuted it. Uh, well, my question is just about the contact tracing device, the token that was mentioned. Uh, can, can you like uh, give us some idea like what it looks like and is it something that people have to wear around their neck or something? And what if they, oh, yeah, they're given free, I understand. So what if they opt out and they don't want to wear it? Uh, I, I don't have a, a prototype to show yet, but uh, in the next couple of weeks when it is, we will certainly uh, share uh, photographs or ideally even the, the actual prototype for you to look at. Um, no, I don't think you will wear it. Uh, in fact, I, it's a trace together token. I expect it to be used when you do, are not using your handphone you would probably leave it in your bag or, 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 or somewhere beside you. Uh, that's how I, I, I see it being used. So I think the key point here is that it will interoperate with Trace Together on the handphone. Thank you, Minister. We will now take the last question from CNA. Si Hui, please. 
Prime Ministers and Dr. Kenneth Mark, I have a question uh, for Dr. Balakrishnan. So 1.8 million people are on the app. Is there an aim as to how many people you'd like to uh, get on the Trace Together app and by when? Um, and as our borders open, will visitors be also using the Trace Together app? Uh, and how do we ensure that they don't misuse it or you know collect some data and then bring it back to their country? Good, Thank you. good very good questions. Because this is in fact an expansion of the existing Trace Together program, the question is not so much just how many people be using devices; it's how many people are participating in the Trace Together program. I've explained today we have about 25%. That mathematically is still too low. Uh, I, ideally, I would want it to be above 75%. And as I've said, this will involve a lot of persuasion, education, explanation, and reassurance. And we will continue to do that. With respect to visitors, clearly, if the Trace Together program is working. We would also want others in our midst, visitors, to also be using and participating in the same program. Because that will enable us, again, to come back to the fundamental, which is identify as quickly as possible the close contacts. And the other element, which I should have explained earlier, is not only people whom a patient may have transmitted it to, but we're also interested in where the source of that transmission chain may have originated. So short answer to your question, yes, we will, we will encourage uh, or we will lean very heavily on making visitors participate in our national contact tracing program.